Hello, Urus. Again, yes, we have the next speaker, as you see, in the yes. front, yes. in the first uh, row, is Rola, who will uh, have a lecture tomorrow. Uh, so, uh, nice to see you. Uh, and now, uh, we will start the second part of uh, uh, Ruslan lecture. Uh, so, Ruslan is yours. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Can you can you hear me well? Uh, just yeah. as before, yeah. everything is fine. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, so, as a second part of uh, the talk, I'm I'm gonna just spend the first part uh, giving you a little bit uh, more on uh, some of um, uh, a model, a particular one, structured and robust models, and then I'm jumping to the multi-model deep learning. So, and, and try to show you some um, some uh, interesting examples that we've been working on in the, in the last year. Okay. So let's look at one particular uh, example here. Uh, this is the Yale B extended phase data set. Um, and you have different uh, uh, lying conditions, right? And due to extreme eliminations of these models, um, it's very often that these models perform quite poorly on this particular data set. Um, and so one of the things that, uh, well, one thing I should point out is that recently there was a paper coming from Google that basically showed that standard neural nets can actually solve this problem provided that you have millions and millions of data. So potentially these models can actually learn useful representations of, of very extreme illumination conditions and occlusions by having access to more data. But let's look at that particular data set where we don't have a lot of data. And so what we'd like to do is we'd like to uh, put a little bit more structure into these models. Let's say we have an observed image. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to get illumination independent representation of the image, right? And maybe we can build models of what the illumination independent representation of the image should look like. And then there's a generative model of, of, uh, <clears throat> of uh, um, this is called the surface normal, and then there's a lighting direction, right? And we can think about putting a particular structure into the model where we have undirected models, modeling the shapes of faces. And then we have combination of these different sources into the observed image. And this is something that's uh, coming to us from a so-called Lambertian model. And it's a, it's a very um, simple model that's coming to us from computer graphics community. And the way that you can think about this model is that uh, it's, it's a simple model of the image formation. <clears throat> we have an image albedo, which is material dependent, but uh, illumination independent. That's something that we're trying to extract. There's a surface normal. And then there is um, um, uh, a light source, right? And the way that the image formation is done is you're basically doing uh, a dot product between these different components, right? And images with different illuminations can be generated by if you vary the light, uh, the light directions. So this is a very simple model. I mean, it's not a perfect model because you know if if, if you have material dependent properties, then then you have to come up with something a little bit more complicated. But as a first approximation, we, for example, we can take this model as the prime knowledge of how images are formed and incorporate that into the deep learning framework. So in this case, we can say the probability of the observed image, we have a light source, we have surface normals, we have image albedo, and they combined in this way, effectively, you, you're effectively doing sort of a factorization, matrix factorization in this case. And then you can say, well, the prior over the faces is going to be coming from a Gaussian deep Bose machine or Gaussian deep belief network. Surface normal is the same. Light direction, you know, you're going to just have a simple prior, which is just the, the mean and covariance. And so the nice thing about this model is that this entire structure is inferred from the data, but you are incorporating the prior knowledge into the likelihood, how images are formed. Right? So you're having these specific multiplicative interactions here. Um, inferences, again, you can do variational inference, you can do stochastic approximation and such. Um, and then the other thing that you can do is you can basically pre-train this generative model on clean faces or elimination independent representation of faces. And this is uh, where we've done looking at Toronto phase data, data set. So if you apply this particular model, just a very simple extension uh, with a structure, you have 38 subjects, 45 uh, images of varying illumination per subject, and then you're splitting it, then with training in the test, here's what you can do. If I show you one test example at a test time, this is the inferred albedo. So this is inferred illumination independent representation of the face. Right? And because of the generative model, we can do fun things. 
You can do fun things like face relighting, for example, right? So based on a single example, this is what you know the person would look under different illumination conditions, right? Which is which is kind of uh, which is kind of interesting. And then if you're trying to do recognition using only one example, so it's called one-shot recognition, you're just showing a single example of a test subject, this is what the performance of the system is. And you know this is an SVD model. You can think of, about it as the model without using any priors. And you can see that it doesn't do as well with one or two examples, but then it catches up. Once you see five or six images of the same person under different illumination conditions, then you can basically do uh, fairly well. Whereas if you're looking at nearest neighbor, or if you're looking at deep belief network, that doesn't take into account um, uh, uh, these lighting variations, then these models do quite quite poor. Right? So this is one just one example where you can put a specific structure into these models. Because sometimes these models, you know, people um, point out that it's very hard to incorporate prior knowledge into these models. But in fact, you can, uh, to some extent, put the prior knowledge as how images are formed. What about dealing with occlusions, right, or structured noise? Imagine that uh, you get to observe the image like this. There's some noise in the image. This is the inferred truth, and this is the inferred binary mask. Can we, can we deal with that? Well, in fact, we can. We can say, well, there's a Gaussian RBM model that's going to be modeling the clean face. There is a binary RBM that's going to be modeling occlusions. Then there is an interaction term. You can think of this as a just binary pixel-wise mask that tells you each pixel, does it come from mask or does it come from the truth? And then there's a Gaussian noise uh, on the observed variables. So the thing about this particular model is that if we integrate out, if we marginalize out the, the binary mask and the truth and just look at what's the probability of this image given the states of the hidden variables here, you can show that that conditional is a heavy tail distribution. Uh, it's a, it's a, uh, you can think of it as a just composition of two Gaussians. Uh, one with a very broad um, variance, another one with a tight variance. And heavy tail distributions are very useful distributions to deal with whenever you're dealing with, with noise. Right? And so uh, that is precisely what allows us to, to, to deal with uh, that kind of data. And you can do sort of interesting things. So here, you know, I'm showing you the real data, and this is what happens during learning as you're separating the truth from the mask. And so you're separating the true face from the mask. There's a little bit of mistakes here, but generally it sort of captures glasses. Um, and obviously that's a reasonable thing because if you look at the prior generative model of faces, faces should look like this, they shouldn't look like this. And whatever you can't explain as a face, you explain it as a mask. Right. Um, you can do also interesting things like, this is on the test subjects. You know, here's the person. As you're running the inference, this is what you know the model infers as a truth. Um, now, one thing I should point out is that if if we were to keep running the Markov chain forward, then the face would probably change, the eyes, the shape of the eyes would change, uh, but everything else would remain consistent with this image, like the forehead and you know the rest of the face. So this is just a hallucination by the model what the eyes should look like. Same thing with the scarf. So the person has a scarf, and as you're doing inference, the model does completion <coughs> of, of the actual face. Obviously, that might not be the actual face, but it's just the hallucination of the model of, of what the face might look like. Um, and the interesting thing about these models is that you can get pretty huge performance uh, gains if you put this structure into the model, right? So we're not asking the model to just figure out magically some hidden units that are going to be modeling the mask, some hidden units that are going to be modeling the face. We, 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 we're putting very specific uh, structure by saying there's going to be a mask, there's going to be a face. Right? So we're using some prior knowledge. And what you see in here is that um, if you're using this robust version of Boltzmann machines, you know, your accuracy goes to 80%. If you're just using standard restricted Boltzmann machine without putting that structure, your accuracy is like 32%. Right? So there's a huge gap in performance. And also there's a huge gap in performance you know, for some glasses. So these are just a uh, you know, couple of examples where you can put some prior knowledge. Now, so what about, um, uh, I've talked about like, you know, putting some prior knowledge uh, in, in the way we're forming images. What about putting some prior knowledge into the hidden state space or on top of the latent variables? And that brings us to the notion of transfer learning, one-shot learning. Right? 
So this is one of uh, one of the you know, very interesting problems in, in our community, and a lot of people are trying to look at that problem. Imagine I have the following setting. Suppose I uh, show you these handwritten characters, and I tell you that that's an image of a Zark. Okay. Would you say that this is an image of a Zark? How about, how about uh, this one? Yeah, most of you say, what about this one? Yeah, definitely, right? So what happens here is that I've show you, I'm, I'm showing you one example, one labeled example, and you basically can classify all other instances of the same class, right? Before, in the first part of the lecture, right, when, I, when, when I'm showing you, for example, digits, if I want to have a good model for digits, for classifying or handwritten characters, I have to show you hundreds of examples of those uh, images. Right? And in general, let's say, uh, you know, the first time you're seeing a Segway, you can recognize other Segways. So you have a lot of prime knowledge about other things, right? And right now, in our community, you have to have, you know, thousands of examples of Segway before you can robustly recognize Segways from non-Segways. Right? And one of the you know, very interesting concepts is, is how can you learn about new things, you know, a new concept, a new object, which is a high dimensional statistical object from, from few examples. Um, and this is, has a very good motivation from human learning. Right? Imagine that the way that kids learn. Right? Kids see a lot of different things when they grow up. Right? And you know, the first time you show a cell phone, you know, an iPhone to the kid and say, that's an iPhone. Right? The kid knows that it's an iPhone. Next time you show the iPhone, different iPhone, different backgrounds, different viewpoints, the kid knows that it's an iPhone, right? I don't have to show my kid thousands of examples of iPhones under different illumination, under different backgrounds, under different conditions before my kid sort of says, ah, okay, I recognize that. Now I understand that there's an iPhone, finally, right? So we're very far from sort of uh, the way of learning, uh, developing systems that can learn from very few examples. It's a very, uh, uh, exciting area of research, I think. So what is, you know, so how things are done now? I show you thousands of examples of Segways, I, feel, I show you thousands of examples of motorcycles, and I'm going to be testing you what that is. Right? That's standard paradigm uh, that, uh, that we're looking at, right? So this is supervised learning. What about the following setup? Suppose I give you millions of unlabeled images. Just download them from the web. You can look at those images, and you can sort of start understanding how images are formed, what they are. And then I give you some labeled examples. Maybe I show you some images of dolphins, some images of bicycles, some images of tractors, and so forth. Right? And the question is, can you take this old background knowledge right, and learn this new concept from just a single example? Right? And then start testing what that is. Can you do that? Like you've never seen Segways, or maybe you've seen Segways, but without labels, right? Um, and now when somebody tells you that's a Segway, can you classify what that is? And that's a key problem in vision and speech and natural language processing, a lot of different domains. Um, and the reason why we can try doing this, or have, can succeed in doing this, is because there's structuring classes, right? Uh, let's say if you've seen a thousand jaguars and a thousand tigers, and then you've only seen a couple of cheetahs, right? can you recognize cheetahs? Maybe you're going to be confusing cheetahs with jaguars, right? or maybe you're going to be confusing cheetahs with leopards once in a while, but I can guarantee you, you're not going to be confusing cheetahs with trees or with cars. Right? Whereas in existing systems, if I show you one example of a cheetah, you know, I, it's not enough for me to learn parameters specific for cheetahs, right? And I'm going to be confusing you with, you know, trucks and other. So that's one way of doing. Doing is that you're basically saying, well, there's some notion of supercategory. Let's say Segway. You know, maybe you've seen other objects, you know, with motorcycles and wheelchairs, and you say, yeah, there's something called a wheel, there's something called a handle, and it kind of looks like a funny kind of vehicle, right? So at least Segways, I might confuse them with these things, but maybe I should be confusing only with other kind of vehicles, right? And then there is sort of deep models where a way of learning feature hierarchies, right? There is a low level features, like edges, there is a higher level features, which is a combination of edges, right? So maybe you can find these parts, and you can use these hierarchical Bayesian models or explicitly build the hierarchy that tells you 
there are specific groups of objects. Each of these objects shares a very similar distribution of high-level features. So most of the vehicles should have wheels, and they should have handles, and so forth. And you know, animals should have legs and heads and that kind of stuff. Right? So one way of doing this would be to, to do the following. We can use models like deep bolster machines or other kinds of uh, models to learn low-level generic features. So for example, ImageNet models are now very popular models of learning low-level generic or in high-level class-sensitive features, and high-level class-sensitive features can capture certain, certain perceptual structure of different concepts, right? And then you might have a hierarchical organization of categories, right? So you can express priors on features that are typical of different kinds of concepts. So for example, you could say cars, vans, and trucks should be in the same group because you're expecting them to have similar high-level features. Horses and cows should be grouped together because, again, you're expecting them to have similar high-level features, right? So by grouping them together, you can you can build a little bit more more uh, you can do a little bit more modular data uh, sharing and, and, and building relationships there. So how can we do that? That's one particular way of doing this would be to use the following. You can sample Z, which is a random variable so from something that's called nested Chinese restaurant process, which is essentially a very simple prior of the tree structures. Right. So if you want to learn what the hierarchy is, there is a way of defining a very simple uh, prior with trees. So every single tree that you could generate has a probability associated with it. Then you can sample the states of the hidden variables from an HDP, hierarchical digital process prior, which is again a very simple prior that allows category to show high-level features or high-level parts. Right. And then you can sample the observed variables, the, the, the pixels that you see in the data from a DBM model, from a deep pulse machine model, which essentially enforces global consistency, approximately, through many local constraints. So this system can roughly tell you, I'm expecting these kinds of features in the data, right? Maybe they're a little bit noisy, and a deep boss machine is going to clean it up and generate an image that's sort of consistent with those features, right? That's the idea behind these models. And the hierarchical base kind of just groups objects together and says, you know, these objects should have, should have similar distribution of high-level features. Now the objects should have similar distribution of high-level features, right? So you can you can you can learn low-level features using uh, deep balls machines, and the high-level features you know you can learn them using standard Monte Carlo algorithms. It's a little bit slow, but but not that not that slow. So here is what the model comes up with: each image is made up of learned low high-level features. Right? So this is image, and these are high-level features. This is image, these are high-level features. And notice that you know you you share in some high-level features, and then some features are different. So the nice thing is that you basically can say that apples, you know, they're very different in the pixel space. If you look at the pixel space, they're completely different from each other, but they share some high-level features, and you know, low-level uh, and other high-level features are different. And each high-level feature is made up from low-level features, right? So you're sort of combining these two together. And now what you can do is you can learn the hierarchy, right? You can learn that aquatic animals get grouped together, fruits get grouped together, and so forth. So a lot of it is being driven right now by, by the color, because that's the data that we're looking at. And if you look at this guy, you know, with a bunch of apples, each apple is made up from learn high-level class-sensitive features, and you have these low-level genetic features. So you can, you can basically try, you know, this, is, this piece is what deep learning is doing for you. This piece is what the hierarchical learning is doing for you. Like trying to learn how do we group things together. And you can optimize the entire system jointly. So there is a way of doing proper inference in, in this entire joint model. So why is it important for us to do one-shot learning or do do transfer learning? Well, here's a real image. These are reconstructions, and these are high-level features, visualizations of those. Here's the apple, reconstructions, high-level features. Say if we have an orange, the orange belongs to the same part of the heart. Oranges are basically like apples, right? We're going to be confusing oranges with apples. You know, they have similar features. Some features are shared, so these are shape features are shared. You know, some features are shared as well, right? So these are uh, a particular sort of uh, yellowish thing. And then let's say sunflower. We get a sunflower. Well, what the model says, the model says, well, sunflower is like, basically, it's like apples and oranges, right? Visually, they're like apples and oranges. You know, this is a sunflower. They basically have very similar shape, except for these two features. Like, typically, detect something here. 
And the thing about the model is that these features and the entire set is being learned on the background knowledge. So it's the first time you're seeing the sunflower. The first time you're seeing the sunflower, you can't learn these features, right? Because you just have one example. You can just maybe fine tune it a little bit. So as long as you can identify that these features that are relevant to the sunflowers, everything else is shared, you're in good shape. If you look at a dolphin, a dolphin has a very different set of features, right? So you're sort of partitioning, uh, um, you're doing sort of the reasonable partitioning of, of, of the features, right? And that allows you to learn something about sunflowers, right? Because you can, you can use a lot of prior information from apples and oranges. You can say, you know, I know all about these features, and there's just these two features that come up that differentiate apples from sunflowers from oranges and apples, right? And that allows us to, to really share the priors in this part of the heart. Um, now, you can, also, you can also do fun things like generating. Like, given three examples, these are generated samples. Given willow tree, right, it's a weird kind of category. This is, this is what the model believes willow trees should look like. So these are generated examples of willow trees. Given three examples of rockets, this is what the model generates the rockets should look like. And you know, it sort of figures out there should be some kind of explosion happening, right? So it just figures out there's a rocket and something happens to the model, right? So um, the thing about these kinds of models is that there is no image-specific primes. There, no, there are no convolutions. There is nothing that the model uh, you know, has access to about translation invariance and such. You know, the, model, the only thing that the model sees is it sees these 32 by 32 images. These are 32 by 32 by 3. So it sees about um, uh, you know, 2,000 dimensional inputs, right? And figures out how you can group these things together and how you can generate new images of rockets. You can apply the exact same model to characters. And what happens there is that you're learning edges. At the high level, you start learning strokes. Right now, it's not quite right, because if you look at this image, that's not a stroke. It's like two things glued together. Um, right, so you're sort of learning combination of these things at the higher level, and you can now learn pseudo alphabets. You can learn how do you group these handwritten characters together. So for example, in this example, all these characters get grouped together, and the reason why they group together is because you're basically saying all these characters have similar distribution over these features, right? They all share a similar distribution over high over over these high level features, and you can sort of see that you know it picks up these characters. Like it picks up these ones, and so you can basically see that you know it, it, it sort of does this interesting kind of uh, uh, clustering. Now you can also simulate new characters. It's probably the most fun for for this model. You can say, let's say I look at some superclass, right? And this is what a, this is what the real data looks like. Can you generate new characters uh, within the same superclass such that they share the statistics of the superclass? And this is what the model does. So this is the generating characters. These are completely new characters. Some of these characters you don't even see in the training set. So it just makes up these characters. This is another example. So you know, it sort of generates. I don't think there's a character like this in the training set. So it sort of hallucinates new characters. This is another example, right? So you're sampling from the distribution, similar distribution, but then you're combining them into new characters. And, you know, it sort of does a reasonable job. And the same model can be applied to speech, text, video, or any other high dimension data. So these are sort of two, two approaches to incorporating structure. You can either incorporate structure in, in, in how the data is generated, or you can build more structure in the feature space, right? So that you can have a little better understanding and control over relationship between different objects and such. Um, you can also do discriminative transfer work with deep nets. So now I've talked about generative, but you can also do discriminative, right? Uh, you can build a convolutional model, and you can basically build the hierarchy at the top. You can say, I believe that a priori cars and trucks, sh the parameters for cars and trucks should be similar. The parameters of tigers and cheetahs should be similar, right? And you can sort of define these hierarchical priors within the convolutional neural network. And we know that convnets are pretty good in terms of you know, modeling images and getting good representation for images. And, and you, can, you can put the same price. You can say, well, when you're doing classification, softmax classification, you can say that trucks and cars should have the same prior. The parameters that you're using for differentiating between cars and trucks should be similar um, and such. So, so if you build this hierarchy, and that's, that's where the transfer is happening, right? You can basically say cars are pretty much the same as trucks. If I observe zero examples of trucks, 
then I would be classifying all trucks as cars, basically. Right? Now, if I get to see some examples of a truck, I can say, well, that's kind of a weird looking car, but which has like, you know, it's a little bit bigger. It's a weird, bigger looking car, right? If I show you only one example of a truck. But it should still have, you know, wheels, it should still be on the road and, and such. Um, so this is where, where the, the knowledge transfer happens. And, you know, you can actually test these systems on real data. So this one done on the Flickr data set where you have images, you have tags. And you have classes. In this case, you're looking at multiple, uh, multiple tags per class. You have one million unlabeled examples. You have 25,000 labeled examples. And you know these are just some examples of what you can do in terms of looking at the mean average precision. And you know some of the state-of-the-art models where multiple tunnel learning approaches. And here you can actually do uh, you can do much better. Uh, but so. Sorry, right, and you can do, in this case, you can actually do much better. So this is, this is a way of, of you know, trying to do um, uh, a little bit of, of, of transfer learning and, and, and deal with, with one shot learning. So let me switch gears a little bit and jump into the second half of the tutorial and tell you a little bit more about uh, Boltzmann machines for images and then caption generation, okay? So um, it relates a little bit to learning a little bit, putting a little bit more structure into the models, or modeling, you know, not necessarily just images, but dealing with multi data, because that will improve things for us quite substantially. Okay, so if we look at the space of uh, 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 data sets that we have online, right, it's typically the collection of things, images associated with text, you know, you have product recommendation systems, you have multiple attributes, in robotics applications, you never deal with one sensor, in reality you deal with touch sensors, motor control and vision and audio and such. So how can we build a system that would take, let's say, two modalities, in this case images and text, and learn some representation from both of these modalities? Right? How can we do that? And we can use these kinds of systems for doing a lot of things. So for example, we could improve classification. Right? If somebody gives me an image and tags associated with the image, you know, that can potentially improve my classification. You can also do filling in missing modalities. Given an input, can you actually generate, um, uh, can you actually generate uh, uh, words or description of the images? Or you can do the trivial. Given some descriptions like text, can you retrieve the image? Right? So you can do a lot of these things if you're able to build uh, a model that takes those modalities into account. Now, there's some, some of the key challenges. One of the challenges that we've hit is um, you have very different input representations. Right? Images are typically dense, text is typically sparse. Right? You know, for text, you just have five words, for images, you have thousands of pixels. So it's very difficult to learn cross-modal features from just low-level representations. You know, the other challenge is that the data is usually noisy and missing. Right? So here's just some examples where, for this particular image, there's no text. Right? For this image, you know, headshot is a good tag, the rest is not. And this is just sort of telling us what kind of camera was used to take this image. Right? So sometimes it's uh, useful, sometimes it's not so useful. And these are texts generated by the model. Right? So you can see that you know you can actually do reasonably well in terms of generating, um, you know, the text uh, coming coming from the model. Now, if you're building a simple multi-model model, you can use a joint binary hidden layer. But the problem is that inputs have very different statistical properties, right? So it's difficult to learn cross-model features. Right? And this is an example where people have tried doing that, and it sort of never worked well. But what you can do is you can build a multi-model model. You can, you can use a Gaussian model to deal with pixels. You can use a replicated softmax model to deal with word counts. And you can build this hierarchical model. Right? The hierarchical model takes the image, goes to the latent space, takes uh, text, goes to the input space. And there is also a very natural notion of bottom up and top down. So information can propagate all the way from the model. Um, yeah, so, so the text can potentially affect low-level features in the images and the other way around. Right? So in the deep both machine, the information propagates up and down in this model. Uh, and you can write down the proper probability distribution over the joint space of images and text. And that's very important because we are, to some extent, this is just to show to you that we can actually write down the joint distribution over uh, both of these modalities. So how does it work? 
Um, given the image, this is what the model generates, right? So it confuses dog, cat, and sort of does, does reasonably, reasonably well. You know, here it does graffiti and stencil, you know, for this thing does Canada. I don't know why it does Canada, Nature, Sunrise, Ontario, right? Um, so it does, does, uh, does reasonably well. So here are examples where it fails. It's always fun to look at examples where it fails. So for this image, it generates portrait women army soldiers, so it com it's completely confused. This is a good one. For this particular image, it generates Obama, Barack Obama election politics. <laughs> right? And the reason why, it's, so we've looked at these examples, and what happens in this data set is this is a Flickr data set, and there aren't that many images of, of uh, animals, but there are a lot of images of Obama signs. And so, you know, the model basically says, this is, this is a weird looking image, so it must, be, must, must have been Obama sign. <laughs> um, so there are failure cases, but you can detect those, those, those cases. Here's another example. You can go from images, um, uh, from text to images. So given these tags, these are the true images. Nature, flower, blue, green. So it does, does reasons reasonably well. This is a failed case, chocolate case. Cake, it will choose these ones. Although, if you look at this image, kind of, you know, these bugs, they do look like chocolate cake. Right? So, uh, so, you know, that's, again, that's a, that's a failure case. Um, so what's the data set is like? Well, this is a Flickr data set. You have a million examples. And just to show you that sometimes, you know, it's very useful because text here, sculpture, beauty, stone, tell you a lot more about what's going on in the image. Sometimes, you know, this is D8. This is the kind of camera was used to take the, 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 this picture. It's not very useful, right? So you have to deal, in order to be able to deal with the noise, we need to build good generative models, um, or models that can account for, that can account for noisy, noisy data. What's the architecture looks like? Well, this is a bimodal architecture. You have about uh, 200 most frequently used tags, and you have uh, additional 1 million uh, unlabeled data, and we have about 12 million kilometers. You know, it's kind of funny, because when I talk to my statistician friends, and I say, I have a model of 12 million parameters. They, they tell me, you're crazy. 12 million parameters is a lot. When I talk to my friends from industry, you know, people at Google, they look at me and say, what, 20 million parameters? We have billion parameters in our systems, right? So, so the scale of these models is relative to whom, whom, uh, whom you're talking to. Um, and you know, in terms of looking at mean average precision, which is just a way of doing classification. You can think of it as just doing classification and averaging over multiple classes. Um, if you look just at the space of only working with labeled examples, 25,000 labeled examples, you can improve upon SVMs and LDA type of models. But what's more exciting is that if you add a million unlabeled examples, then you're seeing huge gaps in improvement right, across autoencoders, deep belief networks, deep boss machines. So that was very exciting to us because it does show that with unlabeled data, at least for this example, was helping us. Um, Right. So this, this gives us sort of a notion, a, a very simple model that can generate text and we can model text and images. Now, what about, you know, a little bit more challenging problem, right? So we have a system now that can generate text or that can generate words. How about generating you know, a more challenging problem, so generating complete descriptions of images? Maybe you can generate words and put them together uh, into, the coherent, uh, uh, into the coherent language, right? So how can we generate complete description? So for example, for this image, you want to generate a model of a man skiing down the snow-covered mountain with a dark sky in the background. Right? Now that's a pretty complicated sentence, and you have to solve two problems. Right? You have to solve the image understanding problem, and you have to solve the natural language processing problem, right? to be able to generate syntactically coherent sentences. And it turns out that generating sentences is actually pretty hard. It's a pretty hard task. Um, generating sentences that make sense is a hard task. Um, you know, there are researchers working on generating stories. Can you generate, you know, two coherent paragraphs um, from the model? It's, it's, it's actually very hard because you have to take care of the long-term dependencies. Um, so let's look at the caption generation with recurrent neural nets. So one way to think about this problem is to think about um, setting it up in terms of the encoder decoder framework. And the idea here is that uh, the encoder, let's look at the encoder first. You're going to be taking a convolutional neural net, and you're going to be encoding the image. And then you're going to be taking a recurrent neural net, in particular something that's called LSTM model, um, uh, to learn a joint image sentence in that space. Right? So you want to map images and sentences into the same space. 
right? So that's the encoding piece, and let's just focus on the encoding piece for now. And then there's a decoder, and the decoder is going to take a point in the space, and then we're going to be using a neural language model, or you can use a recurrent neural net, to, to generate a sequence of words, or to actually generate descriptions. Right? Um, so let's first focus on the encoding piece. Okay, so there's an encoder that is decoder. But let's start first like an encoding piece, um, which is a little bit easier to deal with. Okay? So the key idea of uh, uh, a lot of the models, right, and a lot of models been around, I mean, these models have been around for a decade, is the key idea is that you want to be representing each word in a d-dimensional real valid space. Or d word, uh, each particular word w is going to be represented as a d-dimensional real valid vector. Okay? in some k-dimensional space. So the idea here is that the hope is that table and chair will, will get embedded into the space that sort of they lie close to each other. Dolphins and whale will get embedded to some space that's close to each other. November is going to be somewhere in there. Now imagine that you're working in high-dimensional space. So k would be, you know, a 500 or 1,000-dimensional space. 1,000-dimensional right? space is a very big, you know, it's a very high-dimensional space. So you're going to be embedding those words in that space. Um, and, and, you know, there's a whole lot of work on learning these embeddings, right? And now, even in NLP community, you see most of the papers, a lot of papers are looking at embedding of words, sentences, phrases, and, and uh, into, into the semantic space. So what can you do here? Well, the hope is that you can embed images, and then you can embed words, or you can embed text, or you can embed phrases, or you can basically embed anything that you want, and you can condition on anything, right? And there is also a very natural definition of scoring function, which is just looking at the cosine or inner products in the joint space, or you can just look at the cosine similarity in the, in the hidden space, in this joint space. And these embeddings actually, they, you know, it's been around uh, uh, for quite some time. Now, let's look at how we can embed sentences. Right? Instead of embedding words, we can also embed sentences. Well, the way you can embed sentences is we can use recurrent neural networks, and we can use something that's called long-term, short-term memory nets, which give us sort of better embeddings compared to using recurrent nets, traditional recurrent networks. And the idea here is that you mapping word into its feature space, and then you're using these recurrent uh, uh, neural networks to actually get the representation of the word. Right? So there is sequence go from left to right in your embedding. Um, there are a bunch of extensions, you know, using byte, so-called bidirectional STMs, where you're embedding forward and backward and, and such. There are many, many different extensions of these models, but the key idea is that you're just walking through the sequence of words, and at the end, this is your representation. This is the sentence representation. And then um, I'll briefly mention the work of Ryan Kiris on learning skip dot vectors, which allow you to learn very good representation of, of, of uh, sentences. For images, you're taking the convolutional neural network and you're embedding it into the semantic space here. Right? So you're embedding it into the same space. So dimensional, say dimensionality of this space is a thousand, dimensionality of this space is a thousand as well. Right? So they sort of embed it to the same, to the same space. Right? And that becomes the image representation. Now, how do we do learning? How do we actually associate images with captions or images with sentences? So we'd like to do, we'd like to learn a joint feature space, and the key idea here is that we're going to be mapping images into the space. We're going to be mapping sentences into the space, and the key idea is to try to make these two points be closer to each other. Let's say I have another image and another sentence. Right? I want the embedding for this image and this sentence to be close to each other. Right? Now, the objective they, that, uh, that we're going to be uh, minimizing is the following. It's a ranking-like loss. It's a very popular objective. It's been around for quite some time. And the idea here is very simple. So S here represents the inner products, or it represents cosine similarity. So higher, the higher, the better. Um, so it's a cosine similarity. And the key idea is that you're basically looking at these points, and you, you're saying, I want this cosine similarity between these two points to be high, and then if I look at some other sentence, like a plane flying in the sky, some other random sentence, I want this cosine similarity between this sentence and this image to be low. Right? I want the similarity between this and this to be low, but I want the similarity between this and this to be high. Right? And that's a very simple ranking-like objective. And you can do the same thing for text. Right? 
Um, this entire uh, objective function is differentiable. We can differentiate with respect to the entire convolutional network. You can differentiate it with respect to the entire recurrent LSTM network. So you can learn everything from end to end, right? Provided you have enough examples. So you're basically learning that joint embedding, um, embedding space. So what can you do? This is some of the things that you can do. So this is, we're not, at this stage, we're not generating sentences, we're retrieving sentences. So let's say I show you this test image. I go to the semantic space, and I find the closest sentence in the semantic space. Right? Um, and this is the training sentence, the closest training sentence, and this is what the retrieval looks like, right? Which is pretty good. Or this one, a boy, uh, boy skateboarding, a phone man playing basketball, two from each team. Um, these are just some other examples. A man is doing tricks on a bike on ramps in front of the crowd, which is pretty good. Women participating in a skip on stage. So these are, again, these are not generated. These are just retrieved, right? And you can do retrieval very, very efficiently because you're just finding, you're just doing nearest neighbor search in the latent space, it's in the semantic space. You can also do these things, right? Given an image, you just consider sentences that contain only one word. And you just find what's the closest embeddings of the words, and, and you can do uh, this thing. And you can also do that way, right? Condition on the word bitch, you, you, you're looking for snow, you're looking at um, the representation of the word snow, and you're looking for nearby images. You can retrieve uh, uh, those images, right? You can also do funny things like retrieval with adjectives. So you never train the model on adjectives, right? The model never sees fluffy in these images. But it sees a lot of, you know, these kinds of images and sentences, descriptions. And the description says, you know, my fluffy animal or something like that, or my delicious cup of soup. And if you look at fluffy and delicious, this is what the model would choose, right? So you can basically, any given word, you can embed and you can look for nearby images. Um, you can also do fun things like uh, doing multimodal linguistic reg regularities. If I sh show you this car, I embed it into the semantic space, now becomes a vector. I subtract the representation of the vector blue, and I add the representation of the vector red, and I look for nearby images in the semantic space, this is what the model would choose. If I say minus blue plus yellow, this is what it retrieves. Or minus yellow plus red, it basically retrieves fire trucks or some buses, right? <laughs> just kind of, which kind of makes sense, right? The school bus minus yellow plus red just becomes a fire truck. Um, these are sort of like fun things, you know, if you have an airplane, the minus flying plus sailing, you get sailboats. This is my favorite one, get kittens minus box plus bowl, minus bowl plus box, you get kids in the box. Right? When you have kid in the box and minus box plus bowl, get kids in the ball. Right? I mean, there's some mistakes, this is actually not a kid, it's a, it's a duck. But, but close enough, right? Uh, so, you, you know, you can do these, these kind of like, uh, <laughs> Uh, these, these interesting things uh, in, in the latent space. You can also do other things. You can try um, use exactly similar ideas for zero shot run. So imagine that I give you the following task. Um, I give you a Wikipedia article, right? And then I ask you, can you classify uh, these images? So can you tell me, so this, this particular image talks about Canada Wobbler, can you find me Canada World? World. Very hard to pronounce uh, the name of the bird for me. Can you actually solve this task? I give you the description. Can you find me the image? How many of you think that this is the right answer? What about this one? How about this one? Oh, come on, guys. You can solve this. I specifically uh, chosen the example where you can solve it to some extent, right? So if you look at this thing, it says adult males have black foreheads and black necklaces. Black necklace is very important because there's like black necklace here and not here and not here. So that can give you a hint that this is the Canada world, right? So in most of the cases, you can solve what, 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 you know, what we call here zero-shot learning problem. If I give you the description, you look at the visual um, uh, image, and you can actually you know, classify the visual image. Right? You can classify it perfectly, almost perfectly. Um, so that's the right answer. Right? Here's, and, and so how, how can you do that? Well, the way you can do it is you can basically do the following. You can say, I have some Wikipedia article. I do transformation using TF-IDF. This is just one way of doing it. But in principle, you can also use LSTM type of models. 
and you pass it through some nonlinear perception. You have an image, you're using convolutional model, you get to some representation, and then you basically take the dot product between the two representations, and that now represents your class score, right? And you're looking at the compatibility between images and text. And the way you can think about this is essentially what we're doing is we're learning during semantic space. We're taking the Wikipedia article, we're mapping it into the semantic space. We're taking the image, we're mapping it into the semantic space. And then there's another image, right? There's another image. So we basically say, look, we have all these images in this Wikipedia article description. We all want to make them to be very close to each other. And then, you know, I have another flower and another description, and I want to map them close to each other. And you can minimize the hinge loss or cross entropy loss. So now if you show me a new Wikipedia article, right? It might get mapped here. And then if I take images, hopefully those images, related images, are going to be mapped to the same part of the space, and you can actually solve a zero-shot learning problem, right? And the model, effectively, the way to think about this is that, you know, if you consider binary one versus all classifier, right, this is what you're trying to do. Let's, let, let's make an assumption that we're given additional text features. Right? This is the Wikipedia article. And the simple idea is that instead of learning a static weight, that's what you're doing, you basically make your weight be some function of your textual features. So essentially, you know, one way, the other way of thinking about this model is that we're using textual features to predict what this representation should be. Right? And you can use this idea to predict the output weights of the classifier and so forth, right? Which is basically the same idea as mapping it into the same semantic space, right? Because <laughs> here you're using dot product, right? It essentially looks at the cosine similarity between images and, you know, whatever representation of the text is, right? And so the problem setup is actually a very interesting problem setup. Let's say you have a training set, you have n images, and you have the associated class label, where you have C distinct class labels, but at the test time, you're given, an, you know, uh, let's say 20 um, of previously unseen classes. You've never seen those classes before, right? But uh, you do have access to the Wikipedia articles for those classes, and the goal is to predict previously unseen classes and perform well on the previous classes, right? And essentially, you're trying to learn a good similarity kernel with images and, and, and encyclopedia articles, and Wikipedia articles. Right? And just think of it this way. This way. Let's say, uh, you know, at the training time, I give you a Wikipedia article about tigers, and I show you a bunch of images of tigers. So you know, you know, the relationship between Wikipedia articles and tigers. At the test time, I show you a new class, and I, and I give you, you know, what about Siberian tigers? Right? And I give you a Wikipedia article about Siberian tigers. And the Wikipedia article talks about snow, you know, tigers and snow. And the model basically can't figure out, so what is Siberian tiger? It's basically tiger plus snow, right? I'm, I'm, I'm you know, making it a little bit simple, but if you're seeing tigers and snow, or like white tigers plus snow, then these are gonna be Siberian tigers, right? And that's essentially what the model is, is attempting to do. So if you're looking at, for example, this is a, a bird's data set, an observed flower data set. Um, so, for example, on the uh, bird data set, you have about 6,000 images, you have about 200 bird species. Uh, there's one Wikipedia article across for each class. We have access to the description of the class, and the number of average of words per class is about 400. And out of 200 classes, 400 are defined as unseen. So, you never see those four, uh, sorry, 40, 40 classes as defined as unseen, so you never see those 40 classes. Right? And the Oxford Flower has pretty much the same setup. You have about 102 classes, um, and then you're basically saying 82 classes are used for training, and 20 classes are used, you know, testing the system on unseen classes. So you never see, you know, 20 examples of of uh, of particular mushrooms, right, or flowers. So if you look at the if you look at the birds data set, the results are actually pretty interesting. Right? Um, there are some baselines that attempted to do. Um, uh, DA stands for domain adaptation uh, approaches. And what's interesting about this particular approach is that, you know, if you're using zero-shot classification, you're sort of getting the uh, area under the ROC curve of 0.82, which is not that bad. Right? It's not perfect, but it's not that bad. It's actually pretty interesting. I was very surprised that, you know, you're trying to differentiate between different kinds of birds, um, and you're getting this kind of, uh, this kind of error, right? Uh, I try to do it myself, 
I don't think I could do better than the algorithm because you know just reading the description of Wikipedia article, you really have to catch you know s simple uh, key concepts to differentiate between the birds. Notice that for the same classes, for the classes that you have the data, you have images for, you're pretty much sitting close to uh, close to 100%. So the model has no problem figuring out how to associate Wikipedia article with images if you give it enough examples, right? Uh, on the flowers data set, it's actually much worse. So we're sitting in you know, close to 0 0.7, 0 0.71, which is a much worse performance, but dealing with flowers is a much, much harder task. Again, I try to differentiate between different kinds of flowers. It's, it's tough, just reading Wikipedia articles about flowers, and trying to differentiate which flower is what. Um, at the same time, on the scene classes, you can see that the model is able, is able to do quite well. Okay. The, the other thing that you can do, the fun thing you can do is the following. Let's say I give you this particular description of the bird. I take this representation, I go to the semantic space, and I look for nearest neighbors. And this is what it discovers. These are nearest neighbors. So it discovers some tanager, but it discovers scalatanager. It discovers some tanager. So apparently some tanager and scalatanager are very different. I don't see the difference between the two, but uh, apparently they are different. So if you have an expert bird uh, expert, they'll see the difference. Um, so you can just do it based on just the Wikipedia description, right? Without actually seeing any images of scalar Um So you have a Wikipedia article for each class, you project it into the feature space, into the semantic space, and you just do nearest neighbors from the test set. You can also do fun things like looking at word sensitivities for unseen classes. So you can define attributes, so for example, you can basically say what are the most important words in such a way that really affect your classification performance. So you can look at the sensitivity of words with respect to the output of the network. And it basically finds that these are very important attributes. So it's kind of like unsupervised discovery of the attributes for this class. So obviously, Tanegers, ten, it should be Tanegers, Taniger, Scarlet. And then you have these two words, I don't know what they mean, so I looked them up, and apparently those are the specific groups of birds, you know, scarlet tanager belongs to, right? So sometimes people, people define groups of birds, so it's a very specific terms that are related to scarlet, which is kind of nice. Um, so you can find sort of the most important points, the most, the most important attributes that define these birds. And you can do the same thing for uh, flowers, right? There's a description of bearded iris. That's bearded iris. It achieves these things. And in terms of word sensitivity, you know, you're finding things like freezing. Apparently, you know, bearded iris are very sensitive to freezing. They freeze. Uh, so if you, you know, if you remove the word freeze, you start confusing bearded iris with somebody else, with something else, right? Compost, depth, and, and such. So you, you, you can find a lot of interesting, interesting structure by, by using these models. Okay. So that's sort of the idea of, of embedding, right? The idea of using encoders, a way of embedding images and sentences or images and or, or articles or big text into the same space. Now, how about actually generating sentences? How, how about actually doing that? Well, ultimately what we want to do is we want to be able to build a model of this form. We want to generate the probability of W1, which is the first word, and then we're going to be doing a bunch of conditional probabilities. Second word given the first word, third word given the second two words, and so forth. Okay? So this is the model that we're going to be building. Now, let me tell you about um, a neural language model. Uh, this is the baseline for the model, but as I mentioned before, I think more recently people started using recurrent neural networks, and they work about the same or sometimes better. But let's look at the neural language model. Each word W is represented as a k-dimensional real value vector. right? And let R be V by K matrix. So V is the vocabulary size. K is the dimensionality of the weighted space. So think about V as being, you know, in English, you have maybe 100,000 words. You know, if you're more ambitious, you can, you can do a million, uh, right? And if you're in a big company, you're probably going to be doing, you know, hundreds of million, right? If you want to remember all the names and everything. But let's say V, typically we're working with V that's, you know, 100 dimensional vocabulary size. K is the dimensionality of the weight space, typically 300 or 500 dimensional space. And now what you can do is you can build a very simple model. You can look at the previous n minus 1 words, so it's the context, and the representation 
for the next word here is going to be given by linear combination of the previous words. Okay? And linear combination of the previous words, the C matrix is a K by K context uh, planet matrix. And you can think of this entire model as just a simple um, uh, linear neural network where no nonlinearity is here. You have words, you get the representation for the words, you just do a linear combination of them, right? It's just the average uh, multiplied by these context matrices, and that gives you the representation of the word, right? So that's the predicted representation, and the conditional probability of the next word is given by the softmax, right? So you're taking, you're basically looking at the dot product with all other words, and you're not normalizing. And that gives you the probability of the next word given the previous word. So we, at least we have a well-defined probability associated with, with each word. And that can be expensive to compute, but there are ways, ways to do it efficiently. This was the original model introduced by Yoshio Benji in 2003, um, and basically a lot of different other techniques are just extensions of, of, of that model. Now, what we're going to do is, because we, we have to deal with images, instead of looking at neural language model, we're going to be looking at multiplicative so let's say we're going to be representing words as tenses. So we're going to be working with tenses, where G here is the number of tensor slices. And sometimes we call these G's attribute vector, for example, image features. These image features, and we can compute attribute gated or image gated word representation. It's just looking at the linear combination uh, of uh, the corresponding slices in the tensor. Right? That's the definition. So typically, G is the number of features. Let's say we have 1,000 image features, so G would be, we'd have 1,000 dimensions, right? And the way you can think about this is that every single feature that we get from the image acts as a multiplicative, sort of multiplicative model, right? If, if you can think of these UIs as being binary, then, you know, certain features will shut down certain slices, and certain features will just add their slices. Now, in practice, the problem is that you know, V is high dimensional, K is high dimensional, G is high dimensional. So this is a huge tensor. Instead, you can re-represent tensor in terms of three low rank matrices. It's a common trick people are using, where F is the number of pre-chosen factors. So typically F would be like 20, for example. And you can introduce these three matrices, which are low rank matrices, and you can re-represent this entire tensor, right, this way. Uh, it, it doesn't really matter whether you sort of can parse this out, but you know, think of this as representing tensor as a product of three low rank matrices. Right? Uh, that's the way to think about this. Now, what's the model? Um, we can now look at this representation. So it's just a product of two low rank matrices as, as a K by V matrix of wooden banks. So obviously, you know, this could be very high dimensional, but again, we're just representing it as, as, as a low rank approximation here. And then the predicted next word representation takes the linear combination just as before, right? And given the next word representation, the factor outputs will have this form. And this is the critical. This is where the component-wise multiplication comes in. This is where the gating comes in, right? Because you're multiplying the two things together. So, you know, image features, X here, can shut down some components of the word representation. So, for example, if uh, I see an image and it's an image of outside, of outdoor, then hopefully what's going to happen is that my language model, when I'm predicting the next word, words that are indoors, like stove or you know a toilet, will have will get shut down. It will have very small probabilities, right? And this is where the gating comes in. And then the conditional probability of the next word is going to be given again by the softmax distribution. So effectively, these attributes, these image features will sort of multiply, can shut down certain words, right? And so certain words become less probable when you generate them. And here's, here's an example, right? Uh, if I have a steamship in, let's say, a language model could say steamship in the water, a steamship on the beach, the steamship in, in the dock, right? Or the steamship in the garage, or you know, there could be multiple alternative uh, um, completions. But because I'm conditioning this on this particular image, right, that is going to be the steamship in the water, for example. Right? So the water will have higher probability, or the dock will have higher probability, but you know, a garage or some other words will have low probability, right? because you're gating, gating these attributes. Um, we can also condition on parts of speech tags. Right? Whenever we're generating the next word, we can also use the trick of 
of giving the guidance to the model to generate something that has syntactically coherent structure. So for example, here you're generating the next word, given some context, and then you can condition of part, parts of speech context, what is it that you're trying to generate in the future, and the image. So for example, in this case, I generate A, and then I'm telling the model I shouldn't be generating a noun. It's a soft constraint, it's not a hard constraint. And then a bicycle, and then I have to generate verb, part, and then I have to generate you know, on, that, and so forth, right? So I'm giving it parts of speech so I can guide the model. To, to be able to generate something syntactically more, more coherent. And I can also force the model to generate you know, something, a diverse set, of, uh, diverse set of sentences. So here's an example of what the model is actually can do. Uh, you've seen this example, right? So this is actually a pretty good one. A wooden table and, and chairs are wrenched in a room. Uh, a little boy with a bunch of friends on the street, right? So it actually, these, these examples look too good to be true, right? So it looks like as if the model just caught copies captions from the training set. That's what it looks like. Um, but here's some failed examples, just to convince you that the model can generate novel things. If you look at this example, it says the two birds are trying to be seen in the water. Um, right. Or if you look at this one, giraffe is standing next to a fence in the field. <laughs> here's, here's an interesting one, a parked car while driving down the road. Right. So obviously you can see that you know, a parked car cannot be driving. And so this is a hallucination by the model. There is not a caption like this in the training set. People will <coughs> caption like this, so that's a mistake, but uh, the model does this. So this one, the handlebars are trying to ride a bike rack. So again, this is just doesn't make any sense, but to convince you that this is not just copy from the training set, it really genuinely you know, tries to explain what it's seeing. Or this one, a moon in the boat with one in the garden. So. So it confuses the gender. Uh, it's not very good at gender. Um, you can also do things like completions, right? The cat is in the box. The cat is in, then you say the noun, generate me a noun, a box, and so forth. The, there is a, you know, you generate me a noun, a bus. The bus is generate me adjective, part. You know, there is a cat car behind the bus, so the tree is on the bus, right? So you can sort of do these interesting filling in completions, right? Which is, uh, a way of trying to see whether the model can actually understand what, what you're seeing in, in images. You can also do funny things like uh, this is um, this is a picture of uh, Yair Weiss and David Flit, both computer visual researchers. Um, you know, it, in terms of tagging, it generates clicks and entrepreneurs, and then somehow it also puts them close to waiters and busboy. Not sure why. Um, and if you look at the model samples, you know, this is what the model generates. Two men in the room talking on a table, two men are sitting next to each other, two men are having a conversation at the table. So it sort of, you know, does a reasonable job. It's not very, you know, elaborate description of what's going on in the scene, but you know, to the first order it's actually doing doing pretty well. In terms of results, you know, there's been a lot of work and um, uh, these numbers are probably outdated by now. Um, so, so let me just skip those, but you know, you can do, you can do reasonably well. And then you can also do uh, models with visual attention. So let me just briefly mention a couple of, couple of those, right? So a woman is throwing frisbee in the park, so you can say a woman, when it generates the word woman, focuses on the woman and the child, so that's a mistake. Is throwing a frisbee, focuses on the frisbee, in the park, and sort of focuses on the park, right? And the way these models are working is that you have an image, you have a convolutional network that extracts representation, and then you have a recurrent neural net with attention over the image. So it goes through the steps, and every time it generates the word, it picks up the location, specific location in the image, right? In such a way, and the training of the model happens. How do you pick the locations in such a way that you can generate, the probability of generating the correct sentences as high as possible, right? And one of the interesting things here is that you know, Microsoft has set up a competition, um, and this is based on human evaluations, uh, how good the machines are doing. And the interesting thing, this is the M2 metric, which is basically doing the Turing test. Uh, you're giving a caption to the human, and you say, is this a human generated or is a machine generated? Right? Uh, and you can see that humans are way ahead of, you know, the competitors. So there's Google took the first place, Microsoft took the second place, we took the third place. Um, and so you can see, you know, humans are way better at, at describing images. 
than, you know, than machines. So we still have some room for improvement. There's a substantial room for improvement. Um, and nearest neighbors, nearest neighbors do reasonably well as well. But they are behind, you know, compared to this and this, they are sort of a little bit behind. So, you know, these models are doing better than simple nearest neighbors. Initially, that's a complex nearest neighbor type of approach, but, you know, you can do that. So now, what is, what is, what is visual attention? Let me just give you a little bit of preview about, about um, uh, these kinds of models. Um, there's a, little, a lot of research happening, but just to, to give you just a, a highlight. Let's say you have a coarse image, right? You get to some representation, and then what you're going to do is you're going to select, you're going to sample the action, and the action is basically going to be telling you where in the image you need to look at. Let's say you sample the location, and the location says, look here. Okay? And this is now what you're processing. You're looking into this. You're now getting some representation. And then again, you're sampling the action. You're saying, where should I look next? You're looking next, and maybe you should be looking here. And that's what the model gets. Right? Then you go in, you're selecting the third action, and so forth, and so forth. So you proceed by selecting multiple glimpses. And this is the recurrent network. And in the end, you're going to be spitting out the probability, the probability of the class, classification if you want to classify, or caption generation if you're generating a, word, a sentence. Right? So now the problem with visual attention is that how do you train the network? Nobody's telling you where you should be looking. Right? So these are unlabeled. Right? You don't know where you should look, but you're trying to develop a policy. You're trying to learn the policy in such a way that if you look at those locations, the probability of correctly classifying an image is as high as possible. Right? And so there's sort of hard attention where you sample the locations, and soft attention where you take expectations as opposed to sample. Right? And there's a very beautiful connection to generative models, to give generative models, something that's called Helmholtz machines. So the goal for us, for these systems, is to maximize the probability of the correct class or the correct sequence of words by marginalizing over locations or by marginalizing over gaze variables, right? So you want to do that. And the interesting thing is that these kinds of variables are stochastic variables. You don't know the states of those variables. Everything else is deterministic. So it's effectively, you can treat the entire system as just a neural network with stochastic and deterministic units, right? And if you're treating this as stochastic and deterministic units, then this is just a Helmholtz machine. Um, and this is a definition sort of very similar to the belief network. Where, except for some units are stochastic, some units are deterministic. And what you can do is you can use different techniques like variational intercorders, breaks the algorithms, and the variance to actually learn a good attention policy. Um, it becomes a latent variable model. And if you know you, you check out the wake slip recurrent attention models, the way of training these systems and, and learning the good policy. Right? And uh, and uh, so that's that's all I'm going to say about uh, attention models uh, because it, you know, I, I I don't have time. But then I want to tell you about one other thing. Uh, but check out check out these different um, uh, these different models because they're very much related to deep belief networks, to Helmholtz machines, and variational thing calls. They pretty much lie in the same family of uh, same family of models. And you can do sort of do visual attention for video. Right? So for example, let me just show you some examples here. If you are trying to do action recognition in the video, um, let's see if that works. Maybe this will work, right? So what happens here is that you're basically saying where well, you should be looking in the video so that you can classify it, uh, you can classify it correctly, right? So for example here, the model tends to pay attention to the bike, right? This is the model tends to pay attention to, you know, the ball and the boy, right? And the correct classifiers is a soccer job. This is an interesting one. This is a failed case. If you look at this thing, what happens here is that the correct classification is soccer player, because these guys are playing soccer. Right? So they're playing, you know, uh, whereas the model says it's a basketball. And the reason why is because it basically ignores the people, looks around, and says, well, this is, bas this is basketball court, so it must be basketball player. Right? So you know, sometimes it can fail, uh, because the model basically never seen people playing soccer inside the basketball court. So it can make it can make these mistakes. Okay. So as a final thing, let me just give you one very uh, uh, last piece: is, is learning representation of sentences. Right? We've talked about generating text. We've talked about generating captions, descriptions. And one key critical piece uh, across all of these models is how can we get good representation of sentences? It's a very important uh, um, uh, way. 
So what we want to do is we want to supervise learning of high quality sentence representations. And you know, one way of doing this uh, <clears throat> so, uh, is, is to basically learn and try to abstract the way of what people have done when, when learning good, good word representations, right? Um, so people have looked at composition operators, like making words into sentence vectors, including recursive networks, recurrent nets, and so forth. And we're basically looking at the objective that pretty much resembles skip grant model, for, but at the sentence level, right? And so instead of using a word to predict surrounding context, we're going to be using sentence to predict the sentence around. And this comes to a very important class of models known as sequence-to-sequence -sequence learning. Right? And the idea of sequence-to-sequence -sequence learning is that you have some input sequence, and you have some output sequence. So you're trying to map input to the output. Right? So for example, think about machine translation. You're mapping English to French. Right? And this is now becomes your learned representation. This is the representation of the sentence. Right? If you can perfectly translate English into French, whatever you need about the English is going to be stored in this representation. Right? And so the skip talk model basically does something like that. That's a very simple model. Given a couple of sentences, hello? I think I've lost you. I think I've lost you, no? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, uh, we hear you, but we have no uh, image. Ah, that's okay. Oh, that's okay. I can continue. So, 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 given given three sentences, what you're effectively doing is you're encoding sentences using LSTM, and then a particular sentence we have to, uh, will reconstruct. Sorry, uh, yes, uh, we have to close and uh, start again. So. Okay, but uh, now I I do not see your uh, presentation. Yes, yes, yes. Let me just do that Again. because I have to do the sharing and let me come back here. How about now? And uh, now is, it better? is okay. Oh, now yes, it's, it's perfect. Okay. I'm almost done. I'm almost Thank done. You. So bear with me. Um, so the, the key idea here is that you're going to be using a sentence to reconstruct the previous sentence and predict the next sentence. Okay. So here's the idea. So for example, if I, if I give you a sentence like, I got back home, I could see the cat on the steps. This was strange. What I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be taking the middle sentence and predicting the previous sentence and the next sentence. Okay? So the key idea here is that you're encoding the sentence, and then you're generating the previous sentence, and then you're generating the forward sentence. And that's how you're going to be training the model. The, 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 the idea is that you're going to be summing the log probability of the next and previous sentences. So this is the objective function you're going to be looking at. It's just the sum of the log probabilities of the two sentences. This is forward sentence, this is previous sentence, and this is the representation of the encoder. Right? This is the representation of the sentence. And you can back propagate everything is deterministic. You can compute derivatives. So it's not that difficult to train to train this model. Now, if you train this model on very large corpus, this is 11,000 books. You, know, you have about 1,000 words. Uh, this is what happens. If I give you this sentence, he ran his head inside his code, double checking that the unopened letter was still there. Right? It's a pretty complex sentence. This is the nearest sentence. This is the closest sentence in the feature space. He slipped his hand between his coat and his shirt, where the folded copy is laid in a brown envelope. Basically, you know, semantically very similar. Right? And you can do these things. You can look at those sentences later, you know, uh, just a sentence and its closest one. Um, you can also do things like testing how good these sentence representations are. Uh, for example, one of the data sets we've looked at is the semantic evaluation data set. And the idea is that given two sentences, you want to produce a score of how semantically related these sentences are. Right? Five means they are very semantically related. One means they are unrelated. And the way you can do it is you can take these skip dot vectors for two sentences. And you can compute component-wise features. So for example, you can just look at the difference between the two sentences and just look at the absolute value. Right? There are multiple ways of, of including uh, 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 them as well. So or taking the dot product between the two, looking at the cosine similarity. Right? So here's, um, here's you know, some of the results of the model. And the interesting thing is that this particular model, this particular simple model, 
basically outperformed all previous systems in the semantic evaluation task in 2014. So a lot of people were using, you know, uh, uh, these submissions to this particular task uh, last year. These are the results reported using different kinds of uh, uh, models. So depending on the tree LSTM is beating us, but we are very, very close. So you can see the distances are very, pretty much the same. And this is unsupervised. We never touch the task. We're just training it completely unsupervised and just testing how good these representations are. Right? And this is, this is ours. This is a fun thing to look at. Um, you know, you have two sentences. Right? And there is a ground truth and then there is a prediction. So for example, a little girl is looking at the woman in costume, a young girl is looking at the woman in costume. Right? So both models predict that semantically that means the same thing. Right? A sea turtle is hunting for fish, a sea turtle is hunting for food. Basically the same, the model does well. Right? Or the man is driving a car, the car is being driven by a man. Both models say same, right? the ground truth and the model. Right? Or there is no man driving the car, a man is driving the car, then it's basically, it says, you know, these are not very similar sentences. Here's the fun thing, this is, this is where, where the model fails. A person is performing tricks on a motorcycle, the performer is tricking a person on a motorcycle. The ground truth is 2.6, these are not very related sentences, the model confuses it and thinks that these are related, right? So, you know, this is kind of, uh, still there's some room for improvement. Right. But it, 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 it finds, uh, it finds um, uh, interesting, interesting uh, examples. So you can also do this uh, exact same model for paraphrase detection. You know, so you have to uh, predict whether or not they're paraphrased. You have two sentences, you say, are they paraphrases of each other? And again, if you look at, you know, if you look at you know, models like recursive photoencoders and the best published results and ours, we're pretty much close to the state of the art. And these systems are heavily optimized for this particular task. Whereas in our case, we're not even doing much of the optimization. We're just taking the sentences and just uh, asking how good the representations are. It's a generic embedding of sentences. You know, you can think of that as sentence to that representation. Um, you know, if you're looking at five different data sets, sentiment analysis, customer products review, subjectivity, and a lot of different uh, uh, examples. Ryan's been running these things with a lot of different examples. And you can see that, you know, we are, you know, a little bit behind, but somewhat close, you know, to the, uh, to the state of the art. And again, without actually doing any fine tuning on these models. So this is using bag of words. These are supervised systems that are specifically trained for the task. And this is ours, which is completely unsupervised. We're training the sentence representation. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, yeah. we see your slides, but we do not see you. Oh, that's okay, that's okay. I'm almost done. I'm okay. almost done. So, if you look, you know, if you look at the code and the data, it's, everything is available online, so for these kinds of models. So if you're working in the space of natural language processing, right, uh, you, can, uh, you can use, use um, uh, the code and you can use the data and, and such. So let me just summarize, right, and ultimately, there's a lot of research happening in the space of multimodal systems, how we can integrate different modalities, images, sentences, videos together. Right? And as a summary, let me just point out, you know, if you look at the space of a lot of different areas, right, deep models, you know, are improving state of the art in a lot of different application domains, looking at object recognition detection, text image retrieval, speech recognition, uh, learning hierarchies, caption generation. So there's a lot of exciting things happening in the space, and there's a lot more uh, that, that, needs, that needs to be done. So at this stage, I'd like to thank you because I think I'm running close close to the time. So I want to leave some time for questions. And uh, if you're interested in the code, there is a website, deeplearning.cs.toronto.edu. There's a bunch of code, and uh, uh, you know, look also at the code on uh, uh, over here, MB Web, that sort of has all the code in terms of uh, uh, sentences and generating sentences and such. Okay, thank you. Hello, do you hear yes. me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Uh, uh, so, uh, Ross, personally, I would like to uh, thank you very much for your uh, nice presentation and for sharing knowledge with us, but also that you have so positive energy on your research and you share this positive energy with us. Thank you very much. <laughs> and maybe uh, two or three questions, but the last one, because uh, tomorrow Rus is not with us at the end. 
he has a PhD defense with his students. So um, the last chance to ask was if you have any question. Do you have any questions? There is silence. Maybe they, they are thinking. But you know, we are deep learners, deep thinkers. Yes, so. yes, yes, yes. I think that people are probably tired, right? It's, 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 <laughs> a, long, it's a long... Uh, uh, there is one. Uh, hi again. Um, hi. A quick question. Are you aware of anyone using any of the methods that you've shown to do something like novelty detection, for example, where you you showed this one approach, I don't know which one it is, memory doesn't serve well, I guess. Um, where, where you had these categories first, like you had basic features and you put them into categories like cats, cars, blah, blah, blah. And does that model, for example, still have all the features or only the features that are in that class? Yeah, so, so um, there are, I mean, there are multiple ways. I think that what you, can, you can definitely use these systems for novelty detection, right? Yeah. And the way to use these systems for novelty detection, I think, is, is you, can, you can estimate what's the probability of the new sample, right? Because novelty detection is you want to basically say, given a new data point, how likely is this data point under my model? If it's very unlikely, that's a novel thing, right? Uh, so if you've never seen this thing before, then the model will say, this must be novel. Uh, a novel model. So you can actually do it by using these generative models and estimate the probability of, of, of new examples. Right? The way that we're doing with category learning is that sometimes we give it a new example and we tell the model that's a new example. Right? And the way that what happens with the novelty type of detection is that you can basically say, given this new example, look at the hierarchy, at least the category hierarchy, and see does it belong to any one of the existing ones. If it's so different from the existing ones, put it under the new hierarchy. So for example, let me give you an example. For, for example, for um, uh, when I showed you the hierarchical Bayesian model, uh, I was working with one particular data set where you had a bunch of objects like cows and cars and so forth. And there was one class called Sky. And statistics of Sky is so different from all the other objects that the model was basically do you know have to do novelty detection to, to some extent say this is very unusual uh, input so that it had to create its own you know branch in the tree and put the sky under the different part of the hierarchy because skies don't look anything like you know cars or or or, or cows and such right so potentially you can use these models for novelty detection Absolutely. It's in the way to, to do it is to really be able to evaluate what's the probability of this new new image, and provided the probability is below a certain threshold, you can declare it to be a novel. Some people have looked at the novelty detection. You know, you look at the embedding, look at the latent space, and you say if that particular point is far away from everything else that I've seen so far, by some distance, and you have to predefine that a priori by how much, you can declare it to be novel. Okay, um, maybe uh, to extend uh, upon the question, so basically you could find a new basic category, like high level category, but what if you find, for example, in your cats, you find um, a subspecies, like if you try to do that, for example, you yes. see all these features that you already have in there, right? Um, yeah. you, your model actually puts it in there, but could you tell, like, I have all these features that appear at least in one example, it's in this category that I already have in my training set, and then I have two new things that look different, like for example, new ears. I've already seen them, but on like a different thing, like a different animal, because they have yeah. these basic features, you could do that, and then you could have okay, there are these right. two new features, nothing else has them in this category, this could be a new subspecies, and I should. Yes. Okay. Yes, that's right, that's right. So you can cool. definitely do that. I mean, the way that uh, you can do with these systems is that you're learning basic features, let's say yeah, 4,000 of them, and then if you have a new subject or a new like cat with some weird ears, but you've seen those ears and you've seen like cats, you can, you know, you can basically create a new class or a new category that says it's a weird looking cat with those kinds of ears. Um, uh, because if you consistently see those new features, then you can define a new category and say this new category will have different distribution of the features, right? 
see you, okay. It's going to have different distributional features because it's going to probably resemble cats, but because of these two new features, you can put it separately. Uh, right? it's, like, it's like the example of sunflowers. Right? You give yeah. it a sunflower, okay. and you give it a couple of sunflowers, and you can do it in unsupervised setting. If I give you five images, and I don't tell you they're sunflowers, but they have a little dot inside of them, right? then you can say, well, these look like apples with dots, and I'm going to call them apples with dots. Right? And you can create its own class, its own category, because it's consistently you see apple with dots. So it's like a new apple kind of class, which we call sunflowers. Um, yeah. OK, thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. So I think we close this uh, lecture. Once again, we would like to thank you very much. <laughs> with you by mail. Yes. So have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again. Yes, you guys have the rest of uh, the rest of the workshop. There's some really great speakers and, and, and lined up. And, and so bad I couldn't, I couldn't make it. I have a PhD defense tomorrow. So um, yes. Thank okay, you. Bye. 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 bye.